There was a sense of something coming over the tops of our cars. A commercial jet screams low over Washington, D.C. And the fireballs just billowed out of the Pentagon. We have watched the tragedy of an outrageous act of barbaric terrorism. Want passenger manifest, surveillance video of the works. The attack on the Pentagon mobilizes hundreds of FBI agents and NTSB investigators. Left. You had the largest investigation in American history going on. They uncover a mountain of evidence. What are you guys doing? Shocking details about the terrorist hijacking of American Airlines Flight 77. Stay where you are now or die. Their strategy was audacious, but not complicated, and it worked. It's nearly 8 a.m. at Dulles Airport near Washington, D.C. American Airlines Flight 77 will soon be heading to Los Angeles. 39-year-old David Charlebois is the first officer. Any plans for the big day? He's gonna take in the ball game at Angel Stadium. Oh, yeah? That'll be great. The captain, Charles Burlingame, turns 52 tomorrow. Captain Burlingame was a former Navy pilot. He was a graduate of the Fighter Weapons School, otherwise and more commonly known as Top Gun. A very experienced airline pilot, a lot of years in service, very professional. The Boeing 757 is less than half full this morning. There are only 58 passengers on board. No, I'm booked all day that day. What about next week? Barbara Olson is on her way to L.A. to appear on a TV talk show. Bye. Barbara Olson was a high-profile lawyer in Washington, D.C., very active in the political circles out there. She was also the wife of the U.S. Solicitor General at the time, Ted Olson. Departure frequency will be 125.05. .05. Runway 30 cleared for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, uh, 30 American 77. On the roll. At 8.20 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77 gets underway. V1. Rotate. It was just a beautiful day. The skies were clear throughout most of the country, in fact, and it was just a really, really gorgeous day for flying. It takes roughly five hours to make the 2,300-mile trip from Washington to Los Angeles. At 8.46, Flight 77 reaches cruising altitude, 35,000 feet. Looks like we're gonna have clear skies all the way. That's what we like to hear. American 77, turn right 10 degrees. Vectors for traffic. On the ground, air traffic controllers guide the 757. Turn right, American 77. I've always equated it to like a uh, three-dimensional chess game, if you will. Steve Baird was an air traffic controller for more than 20 years. We work a lot of airplanes, 12 to 17 airplanes at a time, and they're moving along pretty fast, and so things are happening pretty quickly. American Airlines 77, clear direct uh, Falmouth. Clear direct Falmouth, American 77, thanks. Falmouth, Kentucky is the next waypoint on Flight 77's route west to Los Angeles. All right, time for a bit more coffee. There's not a lot of passengers on board for the crew. They don't have as many people to take care of. There's not as much food service to worry about. I'll have some water, please. So it's typically a more relaxed flight when the plane's not full.
34 minutes into the flight, controllers notice something odd. What are you guys doing? Flight 77 is veering off course. American 77 center. At the point where the controller noticed the aircraft take a turn that he did not instruct him to do, that's when he would become concerned. American uh, 77 radio check. Two minutes later, their concern turns to alarm. Seven, radio check. Flight 77 has vanished from their radar. Center calling American 77, American 77. Well, that's extremely rare that a plane would ever go missing, right? They just don't disappear. Controllers usually track flights using a signal from a transponder on board the aircraft. The transponder gives them the flight number, the speed, and altitude. The controller switches his screen to search for a more basic signal, primary radar. Supervisor. But there's still no sign of the plane. American 77, radio check. How do you read? Their concern grows with each second of silence. If I can't see him on the secondary or the primary radar and I can't speak with him, I would assume that he has gone down somewhere and crashed. Center. Then, just after 9 a.m., a call comes in from American Airlines that's almost impossible for controllers to digest. It is Tuesday, September the 11th, 2001. Thousands of people are feared dead. Lower Manhattan is in chaos. Almost everybody that saw what happened, saw it on TV, saw it live, said, this is not an accident. There's no way two planes, two commercial aircraft, accidentally hit both towers of the World Trade Center. No one knew what was going on, except for the country was under attack. And so I think it was very difficult. Where are these airplanes? Are there any other airplanes out there that have gone missing? The fate of the missing 757 is now much more worrying. What if it hasn't crashed somewhere in the Midwest? We need to find that plane. With two aircraft already in the World Trade Center towers, another aircraft missing, air traffic controllers were most likely just going nuts trying to figure out what's happening. Supervisor, I've got a target tracking eastbound at a high rate of speed. At 9.32, more than half an hour after losing contact with the plane, controllers spot a mysterious radar return. Primary radar, that doesn't give you altitude or any you know, real information. If it is Flight 77, it means the plane has turned around back towards Washington. We got to warn DC. America's capital could be the next target. At this point, since he was aware of the attacks on the country, I'm sure he already thought that was one of the hijacked aircraft. Go for 06. Do you have a commercial aircraft in sight? Controllers recruit another pilot to try to learn more. They radio the only other plane in the immediate airspace, a C-130 cargo plane from nearby Andrews Air Force Base. Looks like an American Airlines 757. It's got to be our plane. Center calling American 77. American 77. But the 757 is ignoring all radio calls. And it's heading straight for Washington. It's 9.35 AM, and traffic into Washington is getting congested. I was on my way from my parish to the Arlington National Cemetery for a graveside service. Father Stephen McGraw is stuck on a freeway right beside the Pentagon. I took that exit, actually, because I, I knew that the Pentagon was near uh, Arlington National Cemetery, and I couldn't remember how to get to Arlington National, so I thought, I can't be that far off. I'll take this exit. But in front of the building, there ended up being standstill traffic. 
And then without warning, there was a rush, feeling the vibrations or the sound. I just know there was, a, there was an overwhelming sense of something coming over the tops of our cars. The plane clipped a light pole as it went over the highway. And I turned instinctively to my right and to see just in time the plane coming in and um, just crashing into the building right, right in front of my eyes. There were these two huge billows of fire that came out of the two top windows of the Pentagon, and the fireballs just kind of billowed out. The symbol of US military might is now in flames. Smoke pours from a gaping 90-foot-wide hole in the Pentagon's west wall. One entire section of the building has collapsed. I had not heard anything about the World Trade Center crashes. Didn't have my radio on, hadn't heard anything, and so I just assumed that this was an accident. There's no chance that any of the 64 people aboard the plane have survived the impact. And there are sure to be many more dead among Pentagon staff. On average, any given day, 23,000 some odd people work in the building. It's five rings, five floors, and five levels of military space. With news of a third airliner attack, the FAA issues an unprecedented order. Attention, all pilots, we have a national emergency. We need to get everyone on the ground. Every commercial flight in the country must land. Back to 10 degrees right, begin descent. It's the first time in US history they grounded the whole fleet. Be advised, we are clearing the airspace. Controllers are trying to figure out a situation they've never prepared for and trying to figure out how to get all the airplanes on the ground and accounted for before more loss of life. Attention all pilots. Attorney Richard Newmey was on one of those diverted flights. The captain comes over the intercom system and said, we've just been notified that all air traffic in the United States has been required to land. It was a little bit startling. It was a little bit looking out the window, going, what's going on? Newmey's flight lands in Wichita, Kansas. He'll soon learn how lucky he is to be alive. I was scheduled to speak at a conference. They booked me a ticket uh, on American Airlines Flight 77 out of Dallas to the West Coast. At the last moment, he switched his ticket to a more convenient flight. I had left the original flight uh, itinerary on the refrigerator, drove to the airport, changed the ticket, got on the airplane, um, was very, very concerned that the, my wife was thinking that I was still on that plane. It was one of those things where you know, God was smiling on me that day. At the Pentagon, Father McGraw rushes towards the devastation. He wants to help whoever he can. And we're coming to one man in particular. He said, what is your name? I'm Father McGraw. I'll stay with you. And he said, I'm Catholic. And so I actually gave him, in those moments, the uh, sacraments. Um, and anointed him on his forehead with the blessed oil, the oil of the sick. And when I did that, I remember saying to him, Jesus is I tell you, Jesus is with you now. Can't go back in there. Gotta maintain 500 yards. Thousands of military staff evacuate the burning Pentagon. The United States is under siege. Just across the Potomac River, the hunt for those responsible is already underway. I want passenger manifests, witnesses, surveillance video of the works. We were setting up and actually getting our crew ready to respond to New York at the time. And then uh, obviously we were hit then at the Pentagon. So we changed our plans. Are you the sir? Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Bailey now. FBI supervisor John Perrin sets up the agency's Washington command post. You realize that we're, we're under attack is what we are. And then you realize that uh, this, is, this is something that's never happened before. This is war. But before anyone can grasp the full magnitude of what has happened, 
another threat appears. The FAA has reports of a fourth hijacking. We were told that there was another aircraft heading towards Washington, D.C., and the last uh, timeline we were given was it was about eight minutes out. So uh, what we did was we sent snipers up on the roof with binoculars to look out for this aircraft. Across the U.S., thousands of flights are now grounded. There's just airliner after airliner after airliner parked on the tarmac. Then, at 10.15 a.m., a blackened crater in rural Pennsylvania reveals what's left of the fourth hijacked plane. What was unique about that flight is the passengers tried to retake the flight. They were unsuccessful to the extent that the plane still crashed, but they were successful that it did not crash into whatever its intended target was going to be. Four passenger jets have been hijacked and turned into flying bombs. Nearly 3,000 people have been killed. We have watched the tragedy of an outrageous act of barbaric terrorism carried out by fanatics against both civilians and military people. You never in your wildest dreams would think that they would take aircrafts full of people and turn it into a, literally a missile. Americans aren't used to being sucker punched. We're pretty much convinced that there's a Pacific Ocean and there's an Atlantic Ocean, and this stuff doesn't happen here. And I think on that day, the reality that this is a new world uh, uh, happened. The Pentagon is now a federal crime scene. The FBI is in charge of the investigation. I'd seen my share of deceased, uh, but to see that much in that certain amount of time in that area, I don't care how adjusted you are to it, you, you feel it. The FBI faces intense pressure to figure out who committed this terrible crime and how. Because the crime scene is also an aviation crash site, experts from the National Transportation Safety Board joined the investigation. The FBI's experts on crimes and criminal investigations, and that covers many areas, they aren't necessarily airplane experts, and that's where the NTSB can come in. Tom Houter was one of the first NTSB investigators at the scene. This airplane was hitting a very heavy structure, so most of the aircraft was reduced down to small pieces. Investigators need to find the black boxes and any other evidence that could identify the hijackers. It won't be easy. The massive impact has left a confusing mixture of debris. We provided five, six people at different times who assisted on going through the wreckage, going through the building, trying to find, identify aircraft parts for them. Anything that we took out of the site, we had them look at it and they would identify it to us as either being an aircraft or a file cabinet. It was very apparent that we needed that type of expertise on the scene. Hundreds of searchers and investigators work around the clock. Deep inside the badly damaged structure, the risk of building collapse is a constant danger. The engineers, they had a, a technique to see if the building was starting to shift, and if they noticed shifting or heard creaking, uh, everybody would rush out of it. That happened at least a half a dozen times. The number of people killed inside this legendary building reaches 125. It would have been even higher, but some offices on the west side of the Pentagon were empty. The area where American Airlines 77 hit had been undergoing some, some reconstruction, some remodeling. So there were not as many people at work as there normally would be, probably saved hundreds of lives. As the nation tries to cope with the enormity of the devastation, FBI agents are already gaining valuable information about how the flights were turned into weapons of terror. Some passengers managed to make phone calls from the air describing their ordeal. Everyone to the back of the plane! Now! One of those calls was from Barbara Olson. Barbara Olson called her husband, Ted Olson, you know, the U.S. Solicitor General at the time, tells him that the plane has been hijacked. 
that the hijackers have box cutters and knives, and they've moved people to the back of the plane. She reveals that the hijackers then forced the pilots to leave the cockpit. We need to do something. Barbara Olson was incredibly brave. If she's caught, she calls attention to herself, which may draw immediate violence to her. We'll make it out of here. It's fine. I love you. Not much more information is shared at that point before the, the phone is cut off. Pilots probably thought that by cooperating, everyone would get home safe. Prior to the 9-11 terrorist attacks, all flight crews were told to cooperate with the hijackers, do what they want, and buy for time. Please, stay calm. Everybody move to the back. Traditionally, it, it had been the aircraft was hijacked, the plane landed, the FBI would come on scene, there'd be hours of negotiation, and eventually the hijacking somehow ends. It really just wasn't in the imagination that they were going to crash these into buildings. It's now clear how the hijackers took control of Flight 77. But who were they? And how were they able to carry out their lethal attack? At Dulles Airport, the search for evidence takes a major step forward. Airport security flags a suspicious car abandoned in one of the parking lots. What investigators find in the car is astounding. That was a treasure trove of investigative leads. The items include a box cutter, diagrams of cockpit instruments, and documents bearing Middle Eastern names. They scanned Flight 77's passenger manifest, checking to see if any of the suspicious names are listed. It didn't take too long to figure out who the hijackers were. The trail leads to five attackers. Three were in first class. Two more were seated in economy. The Pentagon attackers are quickly linked to 14 suspects on the three other hijacked planes. They found some commonalities right away. One, that 15 of the hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. And the other notable is that most of them had been in the United States for quite some time. Identifying the hijackers is key, but important questions remain. How did terrorists get weapons past security at a modern airport? And how were they able to fly a sophisticated commercial airliner straight into the Pentagon? The FBI needs to uncover all it can about the Pentagon attackers, including their movements in the days and weeks before 9-11. They scour government records, credit card transactions, travel itineraries, and more. All those pieces of paper and all those documentation, they were generating leads because you probably had the largest investigation in American history going on. At the Pentagon, the exhaustive search effort is paying off. Agents recover the plane's two black boxes, the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. When the boxes were found, the FBI investigators brought them to the NTSB laboratory. American 77, radio check. The recorders could help fill in key gaps in the timeline if their data can be successfully downloaded. Center calling American 77, American 77. The most critical question, what was happening in the cockpit when controllers lost contact with the doomed plane? While they wait for word on the recorders, investigators scrutinize Pentagon security video. They soon discover that the deadly impact was caught on tape. A direct high-speed hit on the southwest wall of the Pentagon. It's now clear why the plane virtually disappeared. When you have an airplane hitting pretty much solid brick, it just vaporizes. There's not a lot left. But the question remains, how did the hijackers evade security and board the plane? Potentially dangerous passengers are supposed to be identified before they even get to the airport. The airlines rely on a computerized screening system known as CAPS. One of the things that, that CAPS does is the computer-assisted passenger pre-screening system. 
is it, it flags you if you have certain suspicious indicators. Investigators wonder, did that pre-screening system somehow fail? When they study the records for Flight 77, they make a startling discovery. CAPS did not fail. It actually flagged three of the five hijackers. A special code was printed on their boarding passes, selecting them for extra security screening. Yet they still got through. How could this happen? There's no question that security was inadequate. Brian Jenkins is an aviation security expert. The CAP selectee process really didn't mean that much anymore. And that was critical on the morning of 9-11. Investigators learn that the extra security screening is minimal. Passengers flagged by CAPS are not searched. The airline merely keeps their checked bags off the plane until after they've boarded. Once they were certain you'd boarded the flight, your bags were loaded onto the plane. Presumption was that the major threat was from a bomb in the hold of the aircraft and a presumption that the terrorists would not be suicidal. After years without a major incident, it seems the airlines may have become complacent. The focus on customer service, passenger efficiency, moving people through the airport was the top priority, not security. But Washington Dulles, like all major airports, has more than one layer of security. How did armed hijackers get past metal detectors? Did they have some elaborate scheme to conceal their weapons? Investigators hope airport security video from the morning of September the 11th can shed light on the mystery. There was a level of security in play, uh, certainly looking for bombs on the person, bombs on the luggage, you know, guns, you know, the typical type of thing. The first two hijackers reached the security checkpoint at around 7.20 a.m. One calmly proceeds through the metal detector without raising an alarm. But the second suspect does set it off. He's carrying something made of metal. Metal detector cut the weapon. Then the security process breaks down. An officer scans the suspect with a handheld detector. The wand turns up nothing. They've done this thousands of times. OK, the alarm went off. OK, now I'm supposed to wand the guy. OK, good enough. Instead of searching the suspect further, security lets him through. Well, they've got a line of passengers back there. Move on. At the time, the bar was set very low for individuals coming through the checkpoint and resolution of alarms. None of the hijackers get a rigorous inspection even though one of them is clearly carrying what looks like a tool or a knife. There was something clipped to his back pocket, which in the video shows that the, the screener never really resolved what that was, and, and that's a failure. But the FAA policy at the time was knives of no greater than four inches in blade length. So even if they had found box cutters and knives on them, those items were allowed on board at the time under FAA policy. Investigators come to a shattering conclusion. The 9-11 attackers didn't have an elaborate plan to foil airport security because they didn't need one. The scary part of their hijack is that it is so simple. It's like having a security alarm system for your entire house and forgetting to secure the dog door. And oh, that's how they came in. Their strategy was audacious, but not complicated, and it worked. The five of them got through security and got on board an airplane. But getting on board with weapons was only the first step. Everyone to the back of the plane, now! The big mystery to solve now is how the hijackers were able to carry out the rest of their murderous mission. FBI agents dig through financial documents connected to the Pentagon attackers. They uncover a crucial lead, a check made out to a flight school in Arizona. Records show 
that Saudi national Hani Hanjour spent several years trying to become a commercial airline pilot. He'd applied to schools in Saudi Arabia to fly and was rejected. Uh, eventually ended up doing flight training in Arizona and was kind of unusual in, in his flight training because he, he flunked a lot of checks along the way. Two months before the attacks, Hanjour rented several private planes, including one he flew to a small airport near Washington, D.C. For the pilot perspective, it's one thing to fly a flight simulator. It's a completely different thing to be up in the air to see what the real world looks like from the air. Airport flight records reveal more chilling details about Hanjour's preparations for 9-11. Just weeks before the attacks, he and one of his co-conspirators booked a commercial flight out of Washington's Dulles Airport. They bought seats in first class aboard a Boeing 757. I think they used the surveillance flights to try to understand how they could take over the aircraft and get into the cockpit. To learn things like, wow, about 30 minutes after takeoff, once we're at cruise, they open the door to give the pilots coffee. So all of that is valuable intelligence and insight for the hijackers. Ted right, American 77. But flying a sophisticated airliner is very different from piloting a small private plane. How did the hijackers steer a 757 towards a target 35,000 feet below? Investigators hope the plane's flight data will provide some answers. Unfortunately, the cockpit voice recorder was too damaged and no information could be recovered from it. But we were able to read out the flight data recorder. They study the flight data to reproduce the exact movements of the plane throughout the flight. Power's increasing, vertical speed is good. Takeoff and climb look completely normal. You know, obviously, you look at the data, you, you speculate when did the hijackers take over the airplane, when did the terrorists you know, start doing what they did. That we don't know with any precision. Clearly, it's sometime before the airplane turned back. Banking left, nice and smooth. Must be the autopilot. The data reveals how the hijackers managed to turn the 757 around. This heading should take us back to DC. They relied on the plane's automation. You don't need to be a pilot at all in the autopilot on. He can put a heading into the autopilot. He can put air speeds into the autopilot. Everything can be done for him very smoothly. And he doesn't have to do a lot of control inputs. Why are we turning? Keep quiet! But as the plane nears the Pentagon, the autopilot disengages, and the flying begins to change. Left, right. This guy is really struggling. Whoa. The altitude is, is jumpy. It even moves up and down. It's a little bit erratic. It's quite clear looking at the data. This is somebody who has never handled a big airplane before. We should stay on that pilot until we're closer. The hijacker quickly re-engages the autopilot to help take the 757 to a lower altitude. Descending now. He's probably never flown an airplane this high. Having to come down from, you know, 30,000 feet down to ground level, that's a whole different maneuver than he's used to in a small airplane. But the autopilot isn't pre-programmed to fly to the precise location of the Pentagon. It's just ahead. Autopilot off. Eight minutes from impact, the hijacker must once again fly the aircraft by hand. Keep it steady. Only four miles from the Pentagon, they're still flying higher than 6,000 feet. We're way too high. We're never gonna hit it. To shed altitude, they make a sharp diving turn to the right. He misjudged his speed and altitude and had to do a 360 degree turn. The aircraft can only come out of the sky so fast without breaking up. So he makes a circle to get the aircraft lower and get it into position to hit the Pentagon. He had a lot of luck going for him. He had a very clear day. So getting back, he probably could see the Pentagon from quite a distance out.
In the final seconds, they accelerate to top speed, almost to the point of breakup. The airplane's overspeed warnings are probably going off. He doesn't care. The terrorist probably could not have successfully landed that airplane. Uh, crashing is a lot easier than landing it, and uh, they proved that. Investigators now understand the deadly flight path of American 77. The flight data solves one more mystery as well. Why controllers lost radar contact with the 757 when the crisis began? Center calling American 77, American 77. Looks like somebody deliberately switched off the transponder here. The hijackers turned off the signal used to track the plane. The transponder controls are on the central console between the two pilots, so you can turn it off right there. It's, it's very easy to do. American 77, radio check. How do you read? With the transponder off, Supervisor. controllers could no longer see the flight on their secondary radar. American 77. So turning off the transponder, if you're a criminal, makes sense because you don't want people to track you. At the moment controllers switch to primary radar to search for the missing plane, Flight 77 just happened to be passing through an area of poor primary coverage. For American Airlines 77 to drop off radar in an area of limited radar coverage, one that's incredibly lucky for the hijackers, but also not totally unexpected, because not every square mile in the United States is covered by radar. Luck may have helped the hijackers hit their target, but the FBI now has no doubt the attack was planned down to the last detail. They chose their seats carefully. They wanted to be closer to the cockpit so they could observe when would be the appropriate moment to make their rush at the cockpit. The crew has no reason to suspect a thing. The attack is underway before passengers have any hint of danger. The fate of Flight 77 is now sealed. Ani Hanjur, he's the pilot. In all likelihood, he's not going to get involved at all in the initial stages of the hijacking. Please don't hurt me. Because if he's hurt or killed, then the mission's unsuccessful at that point. Open the door. Cut your throat. The flight attendants carry keys to the cockpit door. So an option is to overtake a flight attendant, take their key, and then just unlock the door. Open the cockpit! No! The pilots have no warning and no time to alert authorities. There is a hijacking control code that the pilots can put into the transponder, but apparently that didn't happen. Stay calm. Stay calm. Don't hurt anybody. That's the flight attendant they've been flying with probably for years. One of your best friends is on the other side of that door with a knife to their throat. That's a different scenario than somebody you don't even know. Everyone to the back of the plane. Now! The hijackers begin their descent. American 77, radio check. How do you read? I love you. I'll see you soon. It is unlikely that crew or passengers would have thought that the plane is going to be turned into a missile. Whoa. The erratic flying almost certainly gets the attention of the captain, but there's nothing he can do. You have to let me back in the cockpit. Stay where you are now or die. I've got a target tracking eastbound at a high rate of speed. By the time controllers spot Flight 77's primary radar return, the plane is only five minutes from DC. Well, nothing the controllers could have done. 
The 100-ton jet screams lower and lower. Steel light poles snap like twigs. Marine, Marine, pull up. Up, up. Nine eleven shook us to our core. Anybody that was of age during that time, it's like the Kennedy assassination. Where were you on 9-11? And everybody has their story. It, it, it has marked our generation. It was a win for the bad guys. We can't let that happen again. The 9-11 attacks bring immediate and profound change to commercial aviation, both in the US and around the world. The situation for airport security, airplane security, was a lot different prior to 9-11 than it is today. Just two months after the attacks, the US government creates the Transportation Security Administration, or TSA. The federal government took direct responsibility for aviation security, and the screeners are now federal employees. The training certainly has improved. The TSA brings in strict new rules on what travelers can carry on planes. Airports start screening passengers with full body scanning machines. There are also major changes to onboard security. The cockpit doors. I mean, it's not just the door, the whole bulkhead on the aircraft has been made darn near impregnable. It's, it's bulletproof, you can't get through the locks. But perhaps the most important change to security has come not from new rules or better technology, but from the permanently altered attitudes of airline passengers everywhere. Today, the assumption by passengers, if they feel threatened with hijacking, is not one of compliance. You saw somebody in the back of the plane get up and say, you know, start screaming things running to the front of the plane. You have a choice of sitting in your seat and minding your own business, or you have the option of standing up saying, uh-uh. I guarantee you, you're going to stand up. The paradigm has changed. Until we invent the silver bullet or the x-ray for a man's soul, there are going to be performance problems. But it is much better than it was. What is going on out there? Everyone, we're about to evacuate the plane. Remain calm. I certainly knew that with both engines on fire, it was not going to go well. 157 passengers rush to escape a burning 737. Let's go, let's go! It goes up like a bomb. In the struggle to explain the inferno, the smallest parts come under intense scrutiny. The analysis leads to a stunning discovery. Where is it? It was a true breakthrough in the investigation. The failure that doomed China Airlines Flight 120 is putting more lives in danger every day. We really didn't anticipate that there's a risk, and it bit us. Flight 120 is on final approach for landing. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to begin our descent into Okinawa Naha Airport. Please give the flight attendant your full cooperation as it prepare the cabin for a landing. The captain is 47-year-old Yu Chien Ku. What's the weather for approach? Our ceiling is 8,000 feet. Winds are 8 knots. The first officer is 26-year-old Tseng Ta Wei. The pilots have more than 8,500 hours of flight experience between them. Almost straight down the pipe. Yes, sir. Landing this Boeing 737 should be routine. And the 737 is probably the most popular airframe in the world. It's flown by most pilots as they start out in their careers. It's a short-range domestic airplane. Flight 120 is a one-hour journey from Taiwan to the southern Japanese island of Okinawa. This morning, there are 157 passengers and eight crew on board. 
put your tray up and fasten your seatbelt. Jim Caruso is a medical examiner for the US Navy, stationed in Okinawa. He and his family are on the last leg of a long trip home from vacation. The family was returning from Brisbane, Australia. Uh, we had done probably 12 or 14 days on vacation, and we were hoping to be home for lunch. Living in Okinawa has given the Carusos the chance to travel through much of Asia. We got to see China, Hong Kong, mainland Japan, Korea. We have made use of our location to experience the area. Naha Airport sits at the southern end of Okinawa, on the shore of the East China Sea. The pilots reconfigure their plane as they slow down and descend for landing. Let's go to flaps 25. Flaps 25. They deploy flaps from the wing's back edge, along with slats from the front edge. These devices keep the plane airborne at lower speeds. When we start configuring, we begin to put out flaps and slats, which extend the area of the wing and give us more lift and allow us to fly slower. And of course, the landing and touchdown itself are the most complicated part of the flight. They're now less than a minute from the runway. OK, honey, you have to remain in your seat. I think everybody was looking forward to landing, getting off the airplane, and getting back to regular life. It's a textbook landing. Flaps up. Once you're landed, you figure you're, you're home free. The taxi is usually routine. After landing checklist. Speed brakes. All that's left for the China Airlines pilots is to park the plane. Engine start levers. Engine start levers, cut off. With the engines off, they can finally relax. The pilot is relieved. He's no longer at risk. A catastrophic event after you're parked is almost non-existent. Seatbelts. Seatbelts off. The biggest challenge ahead of you from there is making sure you can get through customs. No one ever expects anything to go wrong, especially once the engines are turned off. But one passenger has noticed that something's not right. My wife was next to a woman who made some sort of exclamation towards the engine on the right side. What are we seeing here? What's going on? There was some smoke coming from that engine. That was the first sign that something was out of the ordinary. What is going on out there? Empty ice, off. Star switches, off. The pilots are finishing the shutdown checklist. Transponder TCAS. Hey, what is this? What's happening? Just when they thought they were safely parked. Cockpit, ground. Number two engine fire. A radio call alerts them to an urgent danger. Their plane is on fire. Attention crew on station, attention crew on station. Bringing the flight attendants to their station tells them that what might likely be next would be an emergency evacuation. Dynasty 120, we are calling a fire truck. Remain, stand by. Uh, we have real fire, please. That gets young and older. Cabin crew, prepare for evacuation. Prepare for evacuation. Everyone, remain calm. We're about to evacuate the plane. Remain calm. Fear begins to spread throughout the cabin. Outside, the fire is getting worse. The engine on my side also started smoking and flaming. So now we had both wings on fire. And at that point, people began to panic. Remain calm. No pushing. I had no idea at that point how things would play out, but I certainly knew that with both engines on fire, it was not going to go well. Parking brakes? 
speed brake, and slap lever. The pilots know they need to get their passengers off the plane before flames reach the fuel tanks. But they can't open the cabin doors yet. Engine fire warning switches. Override. They must follow an evacuation checklist. We want the pilots to grab the list, simply read it, and do it. No wondering what step is next, because the sequence of the steps are very important. Pull and rotate. Everybody remain calm. Do not bring your luggage or personal belongings. Seconds feel like hours as the crisis escalates. Finally, the pilots are ready to open the doors. Evacuation required now. Required. No pushing, no pushing. Please keep moving forward. But it will take time for all 157 passengers to make it to the exit. George Ishizaki is watching the unfolding disaster from inside the airport terminal. I just happened to have my camcorder with me. I thought, oh my god, what is happening? Keep moving forward. With the fire growing more intense, time is running out. Let's go, let's go! We were quite a ways back from any exit, since the overwing exits were, were useless. So my uh, focus was really to get the kids moving forward and off the aircraft. Go ahead, go ahead, all right? Jim Caruso stays behind to help other passengers get off the burning plane. I don't actually remember hesitating. It may have been a little difficult to make that decision since the kids were already moving forward. Hey, no pushing. Keep moving forward. The smoke actually started building, and then that's when everything started happening really quickly. Jim Caruso is separated from his family. The heat and smoke are getting worse. He hears a cry for help. The woman behind me pointed towards the overhead bin. I was concerned if she was pointing towards flames coming in. I looked up and I saw a pair of crutches. Everybody was just sliding down the slides, and once they got on the ground, they would just scramble. Once the smoke and fire started building, the cabin became rather warm. I do recall some of the windows actually cracking from the heat. Finally, they make it to the exit. The plane has been burning for close to three minutes. It could explode at any moment. Captain, all passengers are evacuated. You're the last one. I'm gonna get out of here. Typically, the captain will stay until everybody's off, and he will verify that the airplane is empty. The pilots have put their passengers' safety first. But now it may be too late for them. You're going to have to climb up to the window. you first. Sir. All 737 cockpits are equipped with an emergency escape rope. It's designed to help pilots exit through the side window. But it's no easy maneuver. Exiting the airplane is more difficult than it sounds. It's a relatively small window. Going down the rope has a risk. Then. You felt a huge kaboom. I've never felt anything like that. We actually could feel the ground shake. Passengers run to safety as a fiery explosion engulfs the plane they just escaped. The fate of the pilots is still unknown. 
As I look back after the first explosion, I recall crew members fast roping, as it were, out the cockpit. The force of the blast overpowers the first officer. He dropped down from the height of the cockpit window onto the, the ground. Incredibly, he's able to get up and away from the flames. The captain quickly follows. It was good that he did that, because the fire just gutted the airplane. More explosions rock the airport. The fuselage, I guess, melted. The back half just kind of fell to the ground. Finally, fire trucks arrive on scene. Everybody had exited the aircraft at that point and was gathering in the terminal. It was a huge relief to have the kids and my wife and I together. We certainly were looking back at the aircraft again in amazement. Fire on an airplane can quickly become lethal. Incredibly, on Flight 120, all 165 people on board have escaped unharmed. I've never heard of any evacuation where somebody wasn't hurt. To get this many people off in such a dire circumstance in a very short period of time with no injuries is miraculous. If there's a next time, passengers may not be so lucky. Pressure to figure out what happened falls on an international team of air crash investigators. OK, let's get to work. They need to explain how an airliner that had landed safely and turned off its engines suddenly burst into flames. We have no clue. We do not know what happened. We try to find out from the wreckage remains still on the apron. Normally, fires occur in flight, uh, perhaps during taxi sometimes, but rarely in a parking spot after the engines are shut down. The challenge for the investigator is most of the evidence will be destroyed by the fire. Across the globe, there are more than 5,000 Boeing 737s in service. There's a 737 taking off and landing uh, every three or four seconds in the world. If the plane has a design flaw that somehow leads to uncontainable fire, countless passengers could be at risk. We're aware that the 737 is probably the most popular airliner out there. So there's a reason once an accident occurs to try to figure out what happened pretty darn quickly. The search for Flight 120's black boxes begins immediately. One of our main goals initially is to try to find the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder. These are important because a lot of times they tell us what happened. But investigators know that after such an intense fire, there's a chance the black box data will be lost. They need other leads. Good investigators don't rely totally on flight data recorders, for instance, or cockpit voice recorders because they can be destroyed. So we rely on witnesses to tell us their impression of what happened. Well, we taxied off the runway down the apron to our assigned parking spot. Went three parts, we shut off the engines, and sometime after that, we heard the aircraft was on fire. We needed to know what type of fire it was, what the ignition source would be, what the fuel source would be. Those were the areas of our main questioning right off the bat. I radioed the controller, letting him know we had a wheel fire. Investigators know that if a wheel caught fire on Flight 120, there's more than one possible cause. A deflated tire can result in burning rubber. Overheated brake pads could potentially ignite hydraulic fluid. In a wheel well of an aircraft, there are a lot of hydraulic lines. Going to the landing gear assemblies and things like that, hydraulic fluid is very flammable. If a hydraulic leak occurred and it happened to drip onto a hot brake, for instance, now well, there you go. Hey, what is this? We have wheel fire. If the pilots are right about where the fire started, investigators should be able to find proof. They examine the plane's right side wheel well and landing gear assembly. They find scorched wreckage, but not enough to convince them that this is where the fire began. Once we're able to closely examine that part of the aircraft, 
We were very confident that a wheel well fire per se did not occur. The seat of the fire seemed to be forward and a little bit to the right of the wheel well area. It seems the pilots were mistaken about the origins of the fire. Where it started remains a mystery. Solving that mystery may have just become easier. Investigators have recovered the plane's black boxes. The Japanese team, they retrieved the both CVR and FDR. Let's get working on the FDR immediately. On modern 737s, the flight data recorder has thousands of parameters, data bits that come in to the recording device itself. It will take time to download and verify all the data. Meanwhile, the charred fire scene continues to challenge investigators. With all this heat damage, it's nearly impossible to tell where the fire started. They're almost certain the fire began on the right side of the plane, as witnesses reported. But where exactly? Wait a sec. Scorched wires provide a promising new lead. What do you think? Did an electrical fire destroy Flight 120? Serious electrical failures are rare, but not unheard of. In 1998, the cockpit of Swiss Air Flight 111 began filling with smoke shortly after takeoff. The pilots tried to make an emergency landing in Halifax, Canada. They never made it. Their plane disappeared into the Atlantic Ocean, killing all 229 people on board. Investigators found that an electrical fault in the entertainment system almost certainly sparked the fire that doomed the plane. OK, let's see what we got. If the fire aboard Flight 120 was caused by faulty wiring, investigators may now be able to confirm it. They've successfully downloaded the black box data. Any electrical problem or failure in any onboard system should show up in the data. Almost every system on the aircraft is recorded. Its status is recorded. Uh, so we looked very quickly through these hundreds of electrical possibilities, and we found nothing. It wasn't electrical. The analysis comes up empty. At that time, we can rule out some wheel fire or some other electrical fire. Investigators turn their attention to the aircraft's right engine. In flight, the CFM-56 power plant generates internal temperatures of more than 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than molten lava. Could an engine fire have sparked the inferno? We, of course, looked at the engines very carefully, the right engine especially, because there was a lot of fire damage around it. It was fairly easy to look inside the engine and examine the core, so to speak, where all the damage in an engine failure usually occurs, and we, we found nothing wrong. The engine was damaged externally, but not internally, so we eliminated it as a possible factor. What could have burned this entire plane down? The investigation has hit a wall. The cause of the catastrophic fire remains unknown, while every day thousands of 737s continue to fly. There's growing pressure on investigators to find the answer. We knew we had a little bit of uh, detective work ahead of us, and we pressed on. The video capturing the fiery destruction of China Airlines Flight 120 could provide investigators with clues to what started the fire. Whoa. The footage reveals just how quickly the flames spread through the passenger jet. But for investigators, the most important clue is missing. The recording hasn't captured the critical moment the fire started. From the video, we can only understand there was fire and the location of the fire, and it seems that something feeding to the fire. But we cannot understand why. Investigators widen the search for leads. 
What did you see? The effort pays off when an airport ground worker provides a critical detail. Grant Porker on the right side of the aircraft said very distinctly that he saw a liquid running down the leading edge of the right wing before the fire broke out. Fix. Fluid leaking from this part of the wing of the aircraft can be only one thing, jet fuel. The 737 holds 4,390 gallons of fuel, much of it in tanks located inside the plane's two massive wings. When we figured out that an actual fuel leak had occurred, it was a breakthrough, a true breakthrough in the investigation. We now needed to know why it originated. We know the fuel was leaking, but from where? A fuel line? Finding solid evidence amongst the burnt remains of the plane's fuel system won't be easy. The Boeing 737-800 has high-pressure pumps inside the wing. They deliver 200 gallons of fuel per hour to the engine. All that fuel flows through flexible pipes. Could one of those fuel pipes be the culprit? Fuel lines are probably, in a sense, the most vulnerable part of a fuel system. They take bends, and sometimes they're exposed where they can get knocked or punctured by something. So we tried to trace the entire fuel system of the aircraft. It's another dead end. It wasn't a fuel lines. None of the fuel lines are ruptured. We had a lot of fire damage, but the fuel lines that we examined uh, seem to be intact and functional. Investigators still can't explain the fire. They know enough fuel leaked from the plane to feed the flames, but they don't know where it came from. Once we eliminated fuel lines, per se, as, as a possible problem, pretty much the only thing out in that area that could have gone wrong is a leak in the fuel tank itself. The plane's fuel tanks are made from aluminum alloy and designed to withstand the rigors of flight for years. They should never crack or leak. Examining them presents one of the most difficult challenges yet. They hope a tool called a borescope will do the trick. It's a small camera that can peer into tight spaces. It gives them a unique view inside the plane's right-wing fuel tank. What it reveals changes the entire course of this investigation. Whoa, would you look at that? All of a sudden, it clear as a bell, and we saw this bolt sticking out of the fuel tank itself. Where the bolt came from is a complete mystery. But it has ruptured the tank right where the ground worker spotted leaking fuel. It's hard to describe how significant this was. I mean, this was the core of the investigation. Now we knew what happened. The rest of the investigation was trying to figure out why this occurred. A punctured fuel tank was the cause of one of the most infamous air crashes in history. A supersonic Air France Concorde burst into flames on takeoff after running over a piece of metal debris on the runway. Did a similar scenario lead to the total destruction of China Airlines Flight 120? OK, we need to cut into this wing. Investigators need to get a closer look at the mysterious bolt that made a hole in the fuel tank. The investigator in charge said, yep, Now's the time to start cutting into that thing. OK. Got it. Now they need to figure out where the bolt came from. They study schematics of the 737 wing structure. We went back to the drawings and went back to things like maintenance records to try to figure out exactly what it was. They soon get their answer. A 
downstop assembly. The downstop assembly is part of the slat mechanism on the wing's leading edge. Let's go to flaps 25. Flaps 25. Pilots extend flaps and slats during every takeoff and landing. The downstop is fixed to the end of a track that slides back and forth. The device prevents the slats from moving too far forward. The downstop is there, quite frankly, to stop it when it reaches its maximum deployment length. Um, if it didn't exist, then there would be no way to retain the slat on the aircraft. Investigators have identified the piece that penetrated the fuel tank. They know it's not from another plane, like the runway debris that caused the Concorde disaster. But they have other important questions that need answers. We had the assembly. We knew it punctured the tank. Our next step was trying to figure out how this could possibly have occurred. Investigators pore over Boeing service documents to learn more about downstop assemblies on the 737. They make a surprising discovery. This has happened before, and it's happened more than once. There have been two previous instances of this device coming apart and causing minor fuel leaks. Now, this was the first instance of an actual destructive fire. In both previous instances, parts from a downstop assembly punctured a fuel tank, just like on Flight 120. Clearly, they knew it was a problem. Boeing was so concerned about the problem, it issued a special work order to secure the downstop assembly on all 737s worldwide. The solution that Boeing had recommended was to remove the nut from this particular device and install some thread hardening material. And then you reinstall the nut, it hardens in place. What if the work order on this plane was never completed? Investigators review the Boeing work orders. If the plane that burned in Okinawa was never fixed, that could explain the accident. We're trying to figure out when is the last time is anybody touched that assembly? But according to the records, the proper work was carried out very recently. We discovered that this particular component, this downstop, had been manipulated only a couple of weeks or so prior to the accident. Just doesn't make sense. Investigators can see that the nut on the downstop assembly is still attached. It seems that the work order to replace it was completed just as the records show. So what went wrong? That's the weird part that we, we want to figure out at that time. They examine the downstop assembly from Flight 120. They check all the component parts. Finally, they spot something. We decided to count parts, and lo and behold, a, a washer was missing. Where is it? There's supposed to be a washer right behind the nut. Could a single missing washer have played a role in the accident? It seems unlikely. But investigators can't rule it out. They need to find the washer. We thought initially that the washer may have somehow gotten inside the fuel tank, but that's not the case at all. We examined very carefully the rest of the wing. We found that particular washer in the leading edge assembly of the wing, just laying in there loose. The washer is a fit. Recovering the missing washer raises a puzzling question. The nut was on there and it was torqued down correctly, but there was no washer on it at all. How did the washer become detached from the bolt, but not the nut? If the nut is still on the ball, why there is something between will fall off. It seems like an impossibility, and yet somehow it happened. The Flight 120 fire investigation heads to Taiwan and the headquarters of China Airlines. 
Investigators hope to shed some light on the mystery of the detached washer. I appreciate you making the time. We went to China Airlines to ask them to demonstrate how they do the menace work. Do you think you can show me how you completed this repair on a downstop assembly? Sometimes maintenance records don't tell you the true story. They can tell you that according to somebody, a maintenance procedure had been done correctly. But to get a better story, you have to actually watch the procedure being done. A mechanic demonstrates how he performed the downstop repair. You won't be able to see much of what I'm doing. Performing maintenance on this particular downstop is a little tricky. The mechanic is going to be in a very restricted visual area. So he's going to have to work with his hands. He's going to have to feel the apparatus. After applying glue, you put the bolt into place. You can imagine that you're under the wing and you cannot see it. Sorry, I just dropped it. Don't worry, it's, it's easy to pick up again. It's an eye-opening demonstration. <sighs> That's how it's done. Thank you. You have been very helpful. It's not very easy for them to confirm they finished their job and uh, everything is in order there. Records show that the work order repair was the only time mechanics ever serviced the downstop in the history of the accident airplane. There's only one possible explanation for how the washer found in Okinawa came loose. It fell off during the maintenance procedure in Taiwan. It could have just slipped off the gentleman's fingers when he was trying to install it. Could have stuck to the nut and then fallen off just before he touched them together. A lot of things could have happened. The bottom line is uh, the washer was not there. But understanding what happened to the washer still leaves investigators scratching their heads. The downstop assembly had a well-tightened nut that was also glued to the bolt. How could it fall out? And how did this piece start a raging fuel fire that destroyed a $70 million airplane? All right, now let's test it without a washer. Investigators experiment with the suspicious part from Flight 120 to see how it performs without the washer. The design of this assembly requires each component to play a specific role. So any piece that is not reinstalled is critical. They make a stunning discovery. The small washer is the only thing preventing the unit from falling out of its mount. Without the washer, it fails. We discovered that the nut and the bolt was smaller than the rest of the assembly and that the washer was a required item. This is an example of an intact uh, downstop assembly. We'll take the nut off, take the washer off, the nut back on like they did in Taiwan. And now you'll note that the uh, assembly itself is pretty ineffective. It falls apart uh, without much problem at all. Finally, it's clear why the downstop assembly was able to fall out of the slat track. How it punctured the fuel tank is the final piece of the puzzle. But investigators believe the design of the slat mechanism itself may hold the answer. When engineers are designing these aircraft, they take into consideration maximum space utilization. 
And for the design of a leading edge slat, they came up with something called a can. The slat can is the area inside the wing that houses the moving track. The can is a void that extends into the fuel tank and allows for the device that operates the slat to move in and out. The space inside the slat can is tight, just big enough for the sliding track. A foreign metal object taking up any space inside the can would be an accident waiting to happen. It would render the entire assembly uh, not only non-functional but dangerous. China Airlines Flight 120, 157 passengers, 8 crew. Investigators believe they finally understand the sequence of events that led to a devastating fuel fire in Okinawa. It all begins weeks before the accident with a botched repair to a critical component. A single missing washer turns a downstop into a hidden danger. A bolt that can work its way loose over time. Washers really aren't supposed to hold things together, but this washer did because of its design. Six weeks after the failed repair. Please give the flight attendant your full cooperation as it prepared the cabin for landing. A routine descent into Okinawa requires the pilots to deploy the flaps and slats as usual. Inside one of the track cans on the right wing, the loosened downstop is just barely holding on. Touchdown is enough of a jolt to finally knock the downstop out of its track. Flaps on. The unsuspecting crew soon retracts the flaps and slats. The plane's powerful hydraulics move the slat track back into the can. But now the downstop bolt is in the way. The track pushes it to the back of the can and then straight through, puncturing the right wing fuel tank. A hole in the fuel tank caused the leak. The plane would have been carrying thousands of liters of fuel. As the plane taxis, the engine exhaust is powerful enough to disperse the leaking fuel. It can't come into contact with the hot tailpipe or brakes. After landing chuckles. But once the pilots park and shut down the engines, the situation instantly becomes much more dangerous. Engine start levers. Engine start levers cut off. The leaking fuel starts dripping directly onto the scorching hot tailpipe. What is going on out there? The leaking jet fuel ignites on contact. The speed of the development of the fire is incredible. Obviously, fuel burns very well, and it goes up like a bomb. Everybody remain calm. The cabin crew's professional conduct gets 157 passengers off the plane in just one minute and 42 seconds. The Naha Airport fire leads investigators to a striking realization. The repair that was ordered actually caused the fire. It was kind of ironic. The Taiwanese maintenance procedure was to prevent an accident. And in essence, the procedure had a lot to do with why this particular accident happened. It's a great study in unintended consequences. We really were trying to fix a problem. We really didn't anticipate that Every time we handle uh, a maintenance piece like this, there's a risk, and it bit us. In the wake of the Naha Airport Inferno, aviation authorities around the world order the inspection of the entire fleet of 737s. In the US alone, 21 planes are found to have the same defect, all of them at risk of a catastrophic fuel leak and fire. Boeing takes immediate action. It redesigns the downstop mechanism and ensures that the improved part is installed on each and every plane. Boeing made the changes necessary to ensure that the accident didn't occur again. It took a little time, as it normally does, to get to the final resolution of it, but they did what they needed to do. 
violent turbulence rocks Garuda Flight 421. Where did this come from? Strap in. Saat itu sangat keras sekali. The shaking was so violent, I almost lost control of the plane. Terrified passengers just want the nightmare to end. I was scared, extremely scared. Instead, the white knuckle ride gets much worse. Engine one flamed out. And engine two flamed out. You're in extreme dire circumstances when you have a dual engine flame out. The 56 ton jet is falling from the sky. Please forgive our sins. Let us have the strength to save our passengers. I felt that death was really upon us. We were about to face our fate. And so we prayed. A Boeing 737 cruises high above the islands of Indonesia. The crew of Garuda Indonesia 421 is about halfway through a short domestic flight. We were at 28,000 feet on the way to Adisucipto Airport in Yogyakarta. Captain Abdul Rozak is a senior pilot with Indonesia's national airline. How does the weather look in Yogyakarta? His first officer is Harry Gunawan. Should be fine, but there might be a bit of rain. I had flown several times with Harry Gunawan, so it was nothing new. We knew each other quite well. Today, the cabin crew is responsible for 54 passengers. Madam, can I offer you a drink? Yes, I'll have tea, please. Tuhu Wasano has been a Garuda flight attendant for 16 years. Everything was normal. We offered food and drinks for the passengers, we checked the cabin, and we chatted. Suchi Suhayanti is a senior government official on her way to an important meeting. Because of work, I fly often, and I have done so since the 70s. I really love flying. The flight is a 60-minute trip from Mataram, on the resort island of Lombok, to Yogyakarta on the main island of Java. January is the rainy season, when the weather is unpredictable. Let's avoid that sound. Say, heading 300. Patrol, Garuda 421, request heading 300 to avoid some weather up ahead. Garuda 421 confirmed, heading 300. Fly direct to Bravo Alpha NDB after clearing weather. Air traffic control authorizes a slight course correction to steer the plane around some looming clouds. The weather was just like any other afternoon. There was no turbulence. We could see from the cabin that it was bright outside. It was very normal. But soon, more large storm clouds appear in their path. What do you think? I could see the green, yellow, and red on the radar, and I knew that the safest route would be towards the green. I think we just veer a little to the left into that green gap. Should be fine. The weather ahead could make for a bumpy ride. Prepare the cabin for a little turbulence. Hopefully it won't be too rough. Yes, Captain. As a precaution, the passengers are advised to fasten their seatbelts. I never thought it was something unusual. I've been asked to put my seatbelt on many times before. Garuda 421, you are cleared to 190. The Garuda flight is now set to begin its approach, so controllers clear them to descend. But moments later, the weather is suddenly much worse. 
Where did this come from? Well, we're in it now. Strap it. I had directed the plane towards the green. But as soon as I entered the cloud, everything went red. This was a massive supercell. Uh, it encompassed a large amount of area that the pilots were forced to navigate in. I was extremely surprised. We'd already entered the cloud, so like it or not, we had to go through the storm. The sudden turbulence is far worse than anyone in the cabin was expecting. We started to feel the plane shaking violently, and some people started to scream. The turbulence made walking impossible. The trays were flying around. I was afraid I'd fall on someone. The shaking was so violent, I almost lost control of the plane. The engines! The captain spots a serious problem. Yes, sir, one into a drop. They're suddenly losing engine power. Increasing thrust! Nothing! Keep your eyes on them, sir! Moments later, the crisis gets even worse. Engine one flame down! Confirmed! And engine two flame down! Both engines have flamed out, the combustion process extinguished. You're in your extreme dire circumstances when you have a dual engine flame out. The plane now has no thrust at all. Inside, they've lost primary electricity. All systems switch to backup power. All of a sudden, the emergency lights came on. I was shocked to see that. Captain Rozak struggles to keep the plane steady as the altitude starts to drop. I immediately yelled for the emergency checklist. Emergency checklist. Perform engine flame up procedure. Engine start switches to flight. Engine start switches to flight. Start levers to cut off. Start levers to cut off. You take both start levers for both the number one and the number two engine and put them back in the run position. And then you wait to see if the engines light off. Time, 30 seconds. The restart procedure demands patience. We timed it for 30 seconds, as is the protocol, and waited for them to light up. I thought I probably wouldn't see my husband or children again. I was praying for God to help me because I wasn't ready to die. By now, the engines should have restarted. Relay failed. But both of them are still dead. Try it again. OK, let's go. Engine start switches to flight. Engine start switches to flight. The plane is now dropping 1,000 feet every 15 seconds. That's an extreme emergency. Time, 30 seconds. You have very little options, and immediate action is required. For the second time, the Garuda pilots try and fail to restart their crippled engines. Now only minutes from hitting the ground, they're running out of options. After the engines wouldn't start a second time, I knew we still had our auxiliary power unit, the APU. The APU is a jet fuel powered generator that provides electrical power for the aircraft. The APU may be their only hope. Start APU! Start APU! But as they try to start it... We've lost all power! 
catastrophe strikes. When he tried to turn on the standby generator, everything shut down. Okay, figure it out. Electricity was gone. Flight instruments, gone. Everything went dark. I had no tools to fly the plane. Controllers are stunned to see Flight 421 vanish from radar. Garuda, 421, do you read me? 421, please report your position. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Garuda, 421, mayday. We were still within the severe turbulence. We had tried everything in the book. So my co-pilot grabbed the mic and yelled, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Garuda, 421, Mayday. But controllers can't hear the desperate call. Garuda, 421, do you read me? Please report your position. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Garuda, 421. They've lost all contact with the stricken plane. I heard, mayday, mayday. Then I overheard they were saying, no power, no power. That's when I realized the plane had no working engine. Everything was off. No power, no radio. What do we have? Emergency instruments only. They would have the standby attitude indicator or horizon, the standby airspeed indicator, and a uh, magnetic compass. We're in God's hands now. The pilots pray for help. Please forgive our sins and let us have the strength to save our passengers. I felt that death was really upon us. We were about to face our fate. And so we prayed. I was scared, extremely scared. I said some prayers. I asked God to help us. I prayed my last rites and begged for God's forgiveness. I kept praying and praying. That's all I could do. The 56-ton jet with no power is falling fast. But the pilots aren't giving up. Let's see if we can find ourselves in the airport. The airplane would be gliding. It would be losing altitude, but the airplane continues to fly whether the engines are running or not. Confirm our optimal speed for drift down. Yes, sir. I actually couldn't see the standby instruments. They were so small, so I had to rely on my co-pilot. Drift down airspeed. Two, one, two knots. Two, one, two. Current speed, please. Two, three, five. You need to lose speed. It would be very challenging to try to land a 737 without power and without any type of assistance. At roughly 8,000 feet, Garuda Flight 421 finally escapes the storm. OK, let's figure out where we are. But the captain's task still seems impossible landing a plane with no engines and no electronic guidance. I didn't even know where we were because my instruments were dead. We're near the Solo River, sir. Where's the airport? Quickly. We pass it, sir. The nearest airport is now behind them, and they're too low to circle back. They've missed their last chance for a controlled landing. We have to land somewhere. Let's see what we've got. The plane weighs 56 tons. You can imagine how fast we were descending. We had to decide in seconds where we could land the plane. Dropping lower and lower, the crew of Garuda 421 scrambles to find somewhere to land. Right field, sir. Negative, too risky. Landing in the rice paddy could have cartwheeled the airplane. Uh, it, it, it could have uh, made the airplane break in several pieces as well. With his plane falling fast and no other option in sight, Captain Rozak decides to do something few pilots have ever tried. Okay, 
the river then. It's our best chance. Yes, sir. Tell me what to do. No gear, no flaps. Watch my speed. The Solo River is narrow and twisting. Ditching a 737 on it won't be easy. Pertama adalah impact pertama pesawat itu. But I believe the plane would suffer less from the impact. Kita and we'd have a better chance of surviving. Selamat masih ada harapan. But there's another obstacle. Bridge! Can we go under it, sir? No. Gap the jembatan. I wanted to pass under the bridge, but I could make out that there were concrete pillars underneath it. Yeah. 3,000 feet! Captain Rozak makes a split-second decision. Let's circle around and put it down over there. Turn with me! Turning! Looping back could give them a longer stretch of river to land on, but they're running out of time. In order to turn, the aircraft relies on its hydraulic system, and the hydraulics need engine power. A large amount of force is required without hydraulics. It would be the equivalent of trying to drive your car without power steering assistance. Bank angle, sir! Look! I see, I see, I see! Keep turning, but we don't make the river! Turn hard! Begitu dia berbelok, dia teriak. My co-pilot shouted out because he felt the turn was too sharp. But I told him we have no choice. If we don't do this, we will not make it to the river. For the first time, I saw a river, a bridge, and rice fields. But I was confused. There was no runway. Speed! One stop is zero, sir. That'll do. As they line up with the river, First Officer Gunawan notices another problem. There's another bridge! Altitude? 250! Bridge can't be more than 80 feet. We're good. It turns out I had to land the plane between two bridges. 150! Warn the cabin. Bridge for landing. Bridge for landing! Bridge for landing! Brace for landing! Everyone, brace for landing! Okay, okay, okay. Here we go. 50, 40. Help us, God. 30. Brace! From the beginning, I had left it all to God. I had no more fear. I had hopes that I could survive this and that the passengers would be saved too. Flight 421 hits the water at almost 200 miles an hour. The cabin of Flight 421 has been demolished. When the plane finally stopped after the emergency landing, I was very relieved and grateful. I wondered if there was blood on my feet. It turned out it was just water. I said, thank God I survived. I began the evacuation process. I helped the passengers who were near me at the front of the plane. Check on the passengers. From the emergency exit, passengers can wade safely to shore. Check semuanya sudah evakuasi. I was the last person to leave the plane. Keluar dari pesawat itu sendiri. Of the 60 passengers and crew on board, 
all but one make it out alive. I'm very surprised there was only one fatality. It's a sheer miracle that more people did not perish in the accident. Despite the skillful landing, the sight of a 737 ditched in an Indonesian river is disturbing. As crews remove wreckage from the Solo River, the nation looks for answers. How could a state-of-the-art airplane simply shut down in mid-air? The job of figuring out what brought down Garuda Flight 421 falls to a team of Indonesian investigators. Their first priority is to recover the plane's black boxes. It will reveal all the information we need, all of the engine behavior, all of the pilot communications. So we really, really need this black box. While they wait for word on the flight recorders, investigators speak to Captain Rozak. Thank you for coming, Captain. They want to learn more about the pilot behind this landing. Thank you. He has 14,000 hours of flying time, but getting here was not easy. Growing up poor, he sold vegetables in the streets of Jakarta. His family unable to afford school. My only chance for an education was to win a scholarship. There were thousands of people who applied to the National Flight School and I was lucky enough to be one of the 56 students who graduated in my year. Captain Rozak quickly rose through the ranks at Garuda. I was extremely happy to join the biggest airline in Indonesia. It was a dream come true. So, can you tell me exactly what happened? I've never experienced an engine flame out before. I thought these engines could handle anything. My first big question is what caused the engines flame out simultaneously? Why couldn't you relight them? We tried. Maybe they had a fault. Didn't make sense. The downed Boeing plane was equipped with two CFM-56 engines, one of the most advanced turbofan designs in the world. The power plant draws in cold air with a large fan at the inlet. A series of blades then compress some of the air before it's mixed with fuel and ignited in the burner. Combustion spins turbines in the core that drive the engine and push hot exhaust gases out of the rear nozzle at high speed. So there's probably four to 6,000 CFM-56 in use at the moment. Um, it's a very reliable engine and has a very good history. Let's take a look at the occurrence manual. But as investigators learn, even the best engine isn't foolproof. There were some cases with similar aircraft where the engine flamed out. In 1988, Taka Flight 110 got caught in a violent thunderstorm flying from Belize to New Orleans. Both engines on the brand new 737 flamed out. The pilot managed to make an emergency landing on a grass-covered levee. Investigators discover that in response to the near disaster with the Taka flight, the manufacturer redesigned the engine. A new design changed the shape of the spinner and increased the distance between the fan motor and the splitter to better deflect moisture from the core. They found that the dome shape worked better for both ice and hail. So why did this redesigned engine now fail? See, it doesn't make any sense. I was surprised that the dual engine flame out occurred to the engine that has been modified for a precipitation. Engineers run a series of tests on the two engines. They're looking for any defect that might explain the mid-air failure. They find nothing. No mechanical faults of any kind. Everything seems to be good. 
my opinion was that the engine, including the modification, was working as it designed. So my question was, what caused the engine's flame out? At the crash site, a new development brings hope of finding some answers. Divers have recovered the aircraft's flight data recorder. Let's take a look at this. Investigators focus on the engine performance numbers. Now, check out the fuel flow right here. The data shows that when the plane entered the storm, fuel consumption shot up. But despite the higher fuel flow, engine speed remained constant. And yet, the engine rotation remains the same and does not increase. It tells investigators that the engines were working hard, battling against the heavy rainstorm. Fuel flow would go up because of the ingested water, because it increased air density. And then suddenly, the engines died. What changed? The plane's engines were specifically designed to handle large volumes of water. Investigators see nothing in the data to explain why they suddenly cut out. What went wrong is still a mystery. But just as one lead fails to pan out, another turns up. Searchers pull the cockpit voice recorder from the mud of the Solo River. So, let's hear what was happening inside the cockpit. You plug in? Go ahead. Let's avoid that sound. Say At the start of the recording, the audio quality is good. Garuda 421, request heading 300. Yes, sir, one, two, Whoa. Hold down a bit. But soon, noise from the pounding storm makes it almost impossible to decipher sounds in the cockpit. Can you isolate the voices? Investigators can no longer make out what the pilots are saying. They were unable to filter the exterior noise out to listen to the conversation of the pilots because it was that severe. It was super, super loud. When we listen to the CVR, it's really hard to understand. Stop. Rewind. Try again. Then, in the last seconds of the recording, a non-human voice can be heard. It's saying to rain. It's a ground proximity warning. Investigators have stumbled across a huge clue. Not terrain. It can't be. At 18,000 feet, the onboard computer detected something solid below the plane. Something as solid as terrain. When I heard terrain, terrain, I was surprised. First, there was no terrain in the area. There's no amount of rain in the world can trigger that warning. What was happening? Indonesian investigators struggled to understand why a terrain warning sounded aboard Garuda 421 when the aircraft was still at 18,000 feet. Amid the wreckage, the plane's nose cone, or ray dome, provides a critical clue. Come see this for a sec. It was beat up pretty bad. It had almost looked like someone had gone out with a ball-peen hammer and took aggression out on the ray dome of the aircraft. Look at these. I'd never seen this before. There's only one thing this could be. Hail. It's now clear that the violent storm the crew encountered contained enough hail to damage the nose and to trigger the ground proximity warning. The hail uh, was estimated to be the size of tennis balls, which is enormous and detrimental to the aircraft. Part of the engine's recent modifications had specifically to do with hail. The engine is uh, designed to handle 10 grams per meter cubed, a fairly large amount of precipitation. Investigators wonder, did the massive storm throw more rain and hail than that at Flight 421's engines? 
They take the sound of the rain and hail hitting the Garuda cockpit at the moment the engines flamed out and compare it with cockpit recordings of other flights hit by severe storms. How do these numbers match up? The comparison shows that the Garuda flight flew into precipitation heavier than any storm ever recorded. The loudness of the storm, along with the engine's performance data, tells investigators how much rain and hail the 737 likely encountered. That's insane. And based on our tests, we conclude that the amount of ice was more than 18 grams per cubic meters. These engines were well in excess of the manufacturer's tested criteria. It was almost double the amount of precipitation water and hail ingested into the engine. Investigators have compiled convincing data on what caused the dual engine flameout. But to be absolutely sure, they want to put their analysis to the test. Engines power on. OK, let's uh, add some water and ice. The NTSC wanted to determine how much water was actually ingested and if the engine would continue running. So they went and sprayed to the inlet of the engine the manufacturer's recommended amount, and the engine ran perfectly. Bringing it up now. They took the engine and increased the water uh, flow into the inlet of the engine to what was calibrated that they had experienced during the flight. I think we have our answers here why the engines died. The engine test leaves no doubt. That was a big aha moment for them, because adding the ice to the water caused the engine to finally stop. A violent storm combining heavy rain and giant hail extinguished both engines on flight 421. But the investigation isn't over. There's another mystery still to solve. Why did Flight 421 fly into such a severe storm in the first place? Why were the 737's advanced navigation systems... Let's avoid that south. ...not enough to help the crew steer clear of dangerous weather? Investigators review the satellite weather data from the day of the crash. Let me just take a look at this radar map, Captain. OK. So, your track took you straight into the worst part of the storm. Why did Captain Rozak choose such a dangerous route? The plane's weather radar should have helped them find a way around the storm. Why would you enter the storm? Why not detour? I think we just veer a little to the left into that green gap. Should be fine. Pilots were the impression that they had an opening that went all the way through the weather. The radar showed green. We should have been safe. Why would your radar indicate a safe passage? I don't know. But suddenly, everything changed. It seems the radar didn't pick up the danger ahead. Where did this come from? The alley that they were trying to go down closed up on them and uh, was not the good flight path that they were hoping for. Investigators need to know why. Strap it. So this... They consult a radar expert. ...is where they entered the storm. ...and learn that pilots can face the dangers of something called radar shadowing. Radar shadowing is uh, the radar's inability to identify other weather that could be in front of you that you're trying to avoid. Radar shadow? Radar shadows occur when precipitation is so severe, radio waves can't penetrate the skies ahead. A shadow appears on the pilot's screen as a dark gap. So it would be deceiving that you were flying into some good weather, and in reality, you, would, you were entering into another severe storm. The Garuda plane's dangerous flight path finally makes sense. So what you're saying is they sought refuge on the radar shadow. The crew didn't realize they were flying into weather severe enough to knock out their engines. But there's still one unanswered question. The hailstorm killed the engines. Sorry for you. But what killed the 737's power supply? We've lost 
Hingga pada tahap terakhir dia lakukan prosedur tiba-tiba. The plane lost its electrical supply, which means there was no power left on board at all. We were very concerned and needed to find out why this happened. Kenapa electrical sampai habis? Investigators know that Garuda Flight 421 somehow lost all electrical power. If they hadn't lost power, they could have restarted the engines once they were outside the storm. What happened? But they still don't understand how that happened. Thanks for coming, Captain. Please have a seat. Investigators hope Captain Rozak can remember some overlooked detail. I just have a few more questions. Now, take us through exactly what happened after the engines flamed out. As soon as the engines died, we followed the relay procedure. Engine start switches to flight. Engine start switches to flight. Start levers to cut off. Start levers to cut off. Start. They followed procedure to the penny. Relay failed. When the engines didn't relight, they tried to start the auxiliary power unit to restore electricity to the entire plane. And then what happened? Disaster. Start APU. Start APU. We've lost all power. Unfortunately, after two attempts to restart the engines and trying to start the APU, it depleted the battery. Heavy-duty aircraft batteries almost never die mid-flight. So why did this one? The captain doesn't have the answer, but he does provide one very important clue. Is there anything else that you can remember? The battery voltage was low. 22 volts. Even before we initiated the restart sequence. It seemed odd, but... We didn't have time to think about it. When I was interviewing Captain Rozak, he mentioned the battery capacity was just 22 volts when he tried to revive the engines. 22 is within the limit, but it's the lowest value. So it's considered to be weak. A fully charged battery in a 737 has 24 volts. Are you sure it's 22? Not 24. 22 volts. I remember. Another two volts might have made the difference in getting the engine started or getting the APU started. Four weeks after the crash, searchers pull what could be the last piece of the investigative puzzle from the Solo River. The battery from Flight 421. One of its 20 cells shows signs of damage from before the crash evidence that seems consistent with the captain's observations. We found the cell condition was one of the most damaged and has reduced the battery capability quite significant. But how significant was the damage? Was the battery too weak to restart a flamed out engine? Investigators stage a test to find out. Let's start water and ice up to 18 grams per cubic meter. They replicate the flight conditions and follow the exact procedure the pilots used trying to restart their engines. OK, initiate restart engine procedure. Engine start switches to flight. Engine start switches to flight. Start levers to cut off. Start levers to cut off. Start levers to idle. Start levers to idle. Come, 30 seconds. 28. 29, 30. Okay, first attempt failed. Battery to 20 volts. Keep precipitation ready, and uh, let's see what happens to the battery in a second attempt, all right? So we'll start timing once again, and we're going. Try it again. Engine start switches to flight. Engine start switches to flight. Start levers to idle. Start levers to idle. Time, 30 seconds. 28. 29, 30. Battery has dropped to 12 volts, making it practically useless. And now try to start, start the APU. APU. Start APU. Start the APU. We've lost all power. They had no chance. 
the restart procedure completely drained their faulty battery. It was not capable to support the engine restart in, in emergency conditions. Finally, investigators understand all the contributing factors that knocked Flight 421 from the sky. I think we just veer a little to the left into that green gap. Should be fine. A shadow effect on the radar leads the crew to mistake the worst of the storm for a clear path. The storm hits them with hail so severe, the engines flame out. Perform engine flame-up procedure. Engine start switches to flight. Engine start switches to flight. Efforts to relight the engines drain valuable power from a damaged battery. Without power, with their plane dropping fast, far from any airport, it was only Captain Rozak's incredible airmanship that prevented a total disaster. In their official report, investigators recommend better radar training for flight crews to help them navigate extreme weather. They also call for new procedures for flying in heavy rain and hail with the CFM-56 engine, such as increasing the throttle setting when entering a storm. In recognition of their heroism, Captain Abdul Rozak and First Officer Harry Gunawan receive congratulations from the Indonesian president. It's the biggest honor I will ever receive in my life. Beyond the public recognition, the crew has received enduring gratitude. He saved so many lives on board the plane. For that, I salute Captain Rozak. We felt the two of them were chosen by God to bring us to safety on the river. They were our heroes. 